I want to focus on the latter part of the chapter. Look at verse 34. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. Then say at the end to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his, his harvest. And the title of my sermon tonight is Pray Ye for Laborers. Pray Ye for Laborers. I think that's an interesting statement there in 38. Jesus Christ is saying you need to pray for more laborers because the harvest is truly plenteous. And we see in verse 34, he said, But the Pharisees said he cast out devils through the prince of the devils. It's interesting what Jesus is teaching here. He's saying they have no shepherd. All the people. We see that Jesus Christ's fame is rising. We see He starts performing a lot of wonderful miracles. He's healing people. People are being saved. They're saved by their faith. It says that multiple times in this chapter. But we see the fame of Jesus Christ is being known and the multitudes are gathering unto Him. They're like sheep having no shepherd. Meaning what? There was nobody teaching them the Bible. There's no one getting them saved. But you know, the interesting thing is, there's Pharisees and Sadducees everywhere. We constantly see the Pharisees. We constantly see the Sadducees. But does Jesus Christ think anything of them? Does He have any respect unto them? No, He's saying these people are sheep having no shepherd. They have no shepherd. And we see the same thing as today. It's not any different today. There's all kinds of Pharisees and Sadducees and false teachers and doctors of the law and all these people out there. But guess what? The people are having no shepherd. They're not getting saved. They're not going to get saved by these churches. People today, they sit at home and they think, well, someone wants to get saved. There's all these churches. There's all these places they could go. They could get saved if they really wanted to get saved. Wrong. There's all these false prophets and false teachers and Pharisees and Sadducees out there, and they're not getting anybody saved. And you say, well, there's just a few of us going out soul winning. Yeah, you need to pray for more laborers because without you, nobody's getting the gospel. If Jesus Christ and His disciples were not going out to reach the gospel, nobody was getting it. Jesus Christ is coming to all these people that have no shepherd. The Bible says that our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 if you would. The Bible says in Luke 10, verse 2, Therefore said He unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest, that He would send forth laborers into His harvest. Look, there's right for the picking people that would get saved. There's multitudes of people that would get saved, that would even follow Christ. But they need a shepherd. They need someone to go out and preach them the gospel, get them saved, and then bring them into a church where they can be under the shepherd. The bishop of our souls, Jesus Christ. They need to get under this book. But we see when people don't have a shepherd, it's not any different today than it was back then. Back then, there was tons of teachers. There was tons of people that would preach you know, the law, teach all kinds of things, but they're not getting people saved because they're not saved. And a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. And we see the true Pharisees and the true Sadducees today are all these big-name preachers. They're all these uh, big churches, these mega-church pastors who go and get their doctorate and go become a, you know, a, a master of divinity and a master of theological studies or whatever. They're the doctors of the law. But they're not getting anybody saved. And you say, well, I just think if someone wants to be saved, they can go to these churches and they're going to get saved. Wrong. We need to pray for more laborers to be sent out in the harvest to actually preach the gospel, to actually get people saved. You're important tonight. And you know what? You need to pray for more people like you. You say, well, the, the numbers are small. Yeah, we need to pray to the Lord for more laborers. And I want to just drive in the point that without us, the gospel is not going to go forth. Without people going out from a Baptist church, preaching the King James Bible, doing soul winning, these people don't have a chance to be saved. They're not going to be saved by the Pharisee. They're not going to be saved by the Sadducee. They're not going to be saved by the doctors of the law. They need a soul winner to go out and preach them the gospel. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, 
For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed in the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now an interesting thing, a person says in the book of Acts that Moses is preached in every city. And that, you know, I believe that. We see that even when... Uh, Paul and the, the apostles are going out. There's Jews in every city that they're preaching to. They're going into the synagogues. So there wasn't a shortage of people preaching Moses, even back in the day. But nobody's getting saved because they're just false teachers. They're the Jews. We see in 2 Corinthians 3, specifically talking about the Jews. Saying these Jews that are preaching Moses, they're not going to get anybody saved because they have a veil over their face. They can't even understand the Bible. They don't believe Moses. They don't understand or believe the Bible. They're not getting anybody saved. You say, oh, there's all these Christian churches. There's so many saved people. Wrong. We need to pray for more laborers to go out because there's all these sheep having no shepherd. There's all these people that are lost today. Jesus Christ said the harvest truly is plenteous. Why do I believe that? Because most people aren't saved. Most people even that go to church today, they're not saved because they don't believe the gospel. Because they're listening to a Pharisee, because they're listening to a Sadducee. They don't know what the Bible says. Why? Because the person teaching them and preaching the Bible doesn't know what it says. Just like the Jews of the Old Testament, they don't understand the Old Testament. Every unsaved false prophet doesn't understand the Bible. They're not going to get anybody saved. Say, so, well, maybe they'll get saved from hearing Moses read. No, because the guys that are teaching it have the veil. And an unsaved person has the veil. They need someone to guide them. The Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I except some man should guide me? You know, he's, he's reading Isaiah. He wasn't just going to get saved. I'm sorry if Martin Luther's your, you know, hero of the faith. He didn't get saved just reading the Bible under a tree drinking a beer. Didn't happen. <laughs> Wrong. False. No, you need someone to go out and preach you the gospel. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And in that context of that is a person being sent out and preaching the gospel to them. Preaching them Jesus Christ. Preaching Christ and Him crucified. Go to Matthew 15 if you would. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now the Bible's painting a picture here. He's saying unsaved people are, are blinded. Okay? And the, the false teachers, it's like they have a veil over their face. Meaning what? If someone was completely blind, okay, it doesn't matter how bright of a light you shine in their face, they're never going to see it. And the gospel is the glorious light. But these false teachers, these false prophets, they're so blind today that it doesn't matter how bright your light shines, they're not going to get saved. Because they're completely blinded. They've been blinded by the Lord. But we see even the, the unsaved person, he's blinded too. And the reason why they can't believe is because they're blinded. It says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. Now, what would be a form of blindness? There's a lot of forms of blindness. Maybe somebody, they don't want to get saved because they just love their sin of fornication. They love their sin of drunkenness. They love, they love whatever sin it is. And they're too afraid to find out, they're too afraid of God to reprove them, like it says in John chapter 3, that they're unwilling to hear the gospel. They just don't want the light to shine on them, so they just flee from the gospel. You knock on their door and they slam the door in your face. They hate you, they gnash on you with their teeth. They're just blinded today by the cares of this world, by the lust of the flesh. They don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want to know the gospel unless they should believe and be saved. And the God of this world is the one that's blinding them. He can blind them through drunkenness. He can blind them through fornication. He can blind them through the Catholic damning church. He blinds them through family. Sometimes people, they don't even want to hear the gospel. Well, my dad's a Catholic, and my mom's a Catholic, and my sister's a Catholic. I love my religion. I'm not going to change. Don't preach me the gospel. They're just blind today, and they're not getting the gospel. But you know what? 
If nobody ever shines the light, the blind person is definitely not going to see it then. The Bible makes it clear that everybody that's unsaved is, is blind. And it says, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. Meaning we know it. We have it. But if we don't go out and preach the gospel, we don't shine some light, no one's going to get saved. Why? Because it's no different than Christ's time. There's, the, the churches today are filled with a bunch of fa Pharisees and Sadducees teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake today. It's no different back then. The Pharisees loved money. Look at Matthew chapter 15 where I do turn. Look at verse 12. Then came his disciples and said unto them, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. That doesn't sound like salvation. That doesn't sound like hope. Why? The, the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the day are your you know, TV preachers, all these big name preachers. All of them are blind. They don't understand the gospel. And they're never going to get anybody saved. They're just, they're just leading all the other blind people. But notice he says it's blind leading the blind. The blind aren't leading the saved. The blind aren't leading those that are, you know, born again, that have the light, that have been enlightened. No. Why? Because the harvest truly is plenteous. And if we need, if we want those people to be saved, they need to, we need to go out and preach them the gospel and get them into a real church, one that's actually preaching the Bible. You say, oh, I think all these people are saved. Wrong. That just contradicts everything that the Bible teaches about these people. Now, of course, if you find one of these big mega churches, there'll be a few saved people in there. There'll be some baby Christians, some backslidden Christians that don't really, you know, that are saved but aren't following in the footsteps of Christ. They're not wanting to be. They're not wanting to live for God. But by the majority, they're not saved. You're never going to find one of these big liberal mega fun centers, and just the majority of the people are saved in the church. Why? The Bible makes it clear that they're blind teachers. They're blind, these false prophets. Go to uh, Ezekiel 34. It also says in Matthew 15, Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people drive nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. People get confused today, thinking that the battle is between the church and and the, the world. The people that go to a Christian church are the people who don't. Look, the people that you're constantly fighting with in the Bible aren't the ones that aren't going to church. They're the ones that do go to church. And it says, but in vain they do worship me. Teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. Don't be confused that the false teachers, the ministers of Satan, are going to church. But they're teaching Daniel heresy. They're preaching their opinion. They're preaching things which they ought not. Just because they want to line their pockets. It says in Luke chapter 6 verse 39, and he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? Jeremiah chapter 10, the Bible says in verse 21, For the pastors are become brutish, and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. So you look at the time of Christ. We see all the pastors are basically corrupt. All the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law. We go back to Jeremiah, hundreds of years before the time of Christ. All of the pastors, all of the priests are false prophets, teaching false things, lying unto the people. We see it today. Is it any different? No! Majority of the pastors and priests in this country are false prophets, teaching false things. It says in Jeremiah 23.1, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastor, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 23.30, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. Well, I think these, these pastors, at least they're going to the Bible, at least they're here in the Bible, at least they're going to this church. He says he's not going to profit them at all. These false prophets, these false teachers don't profit people at all. They need to get in a real church. That's why I get a little bit angry whenever I go out soul winning with somebody and, and they say, well, I go to such and such Catholic church and say, well, we don't want to take you from your church. <laughs> I, I don't think that at all. I think I want you to never go there again. Don't ever go there. 
Now, of course, I'm not saying you got to be rude to the person and, like, gnash on them. And, oh, you go to a Catholic church? You're so wicked. Of course not. We should always be friendly. We should always be kind. But I would never say that because I couldn't even say that for one second and believe it. That's right. I don't want you to ever go to the Catholic church ever for any reason. Even if you don't get saved, never go there. It will only hurt you. It will never prosper you. Don't believe that some, well, my family member is going to this big liberal church, but at least they're going to church. Wrong. They're not going to prosper. It's only going to affect them negatively. It's only going to make them worse. They're only going to believe more lies. Look at Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 1, right at turn. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy. And say to them, Thus saith the Lord God and the shepherds. Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The disease have not strengthened. Neither have ye healed that which was sick. Neither have ye bound up that which was broken. Neither have ye brought again that which was driven away. Neither have ye sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth. And none did search or seek after them. Man, there's a lot in this chapter. The people, though, I want to make this really strong, really heavy first. Because you start preaching against a person by name. You start preaching against somebody in modern day culture. Oh, I don't think you should do that. He's, he's preaching the gospel. He's got a church. We should leave him alone. I think the Bible makes it pretty clear where God stands against false teachers, false prophets. He calls them out. He has no respect for them. He says they're not going to profit them. Look at verse 3. He says, eat the fat. What is those? The pastors that live richly, that enjoy all the pleasures of this world. They're living delicately. They're just satisfying their own flesh. He clothe you with wool. Oh, they just... Love to have the fancy clothing. Could even be a spiritual uh, connotation of the fact that they're wolves. Clothing themselves with wool trying to be deceptive. They're teaching lies. They're pretending to be a sheep. They're transforming themselves into the ministers of life. But they're liars. They're deceivers. They're antichrists. We see that it says, Ye kill them that are fed. Meaning what? They actually persecute the true believers. The people that are actually believers, the, the true Christians, they kill them. They don't have anything to do with the real believers, the real Christians. It says, but ye feed not the flock. They're not teaching them the Bible. They're not profiting them anything. They're just a wolf. And a wolf is never going to benefit the sheep. The wolf is never going to help the sheep. The wolf will only consume, eat, and destroy the sheep. Look down at verse 5. Because there is no shepherd. That's a sad thought. That's a sad thought to think that there's all these priesters, there's all these pastors, and there's all these people, and there's not even one person that wants to give them the gospel. There's not even one person that wants to teach them the truth. There's not even one person that wants to just give them the, the glorious gospel. Shine the light. We need to pray for more laborers today. Because there's so many people that have no shepherd. There's so many places in this country where there's no man that just wants to stand up and preach the Bible. He doesn't even have to be an elegant speaker. He's not even the best pastor. He's not even the best, you know, evangelist. He's just, he's just standing in the gap. He's just willing to be used by God. He's just willing to preach the Bible. He's willing not to, to, to teach lies and false doctrine. Just one guy. And God could be, you know, show himself strong on the behalf of them that have their heart right toward him. He just wants to find that one guy. He doesn't have to be elegant. He doesn't have to be strong. He doesn't have to be great. He just wants to find somebody. And we need to pray for more laborers in this country, in this world. He's dying going to hell. Because it says in verse 6, none did search and seek after them. There's people that just, there's no one searching for them. There's no one trying to give them the gospel. There's only the false teachers like the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, going out knocking their door, hardening their heart against the truth. Hardening their heart against wanting to actually hear the gospel. Go to John chapter 10. So I read a lot of verses there. I think the Old Testament makes it clear. God was against the false teachers of the Old Testament. God had no respect for the false teachers of the Old Testament. The people were scattered abroad. They constantly didn't hear His word. They constantly didn't do his, you know, follow His commandments. Only when they would have a real shepherd did they even follow God's word. When they have a judge stand up. When they had a righteous king. When they had a man that would stand up and lead the people then they could actually follow God's commandments to some degree. 
But we see without that shepherd, without someone preaching the truth, there's just no hope. Look at John chapter 10, verse 12. But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. You know what the Pharisees are like? They're like hirelings. They're, they don't care about the people. They're just in it for the buck. They're just in it for the dollar. And as soon as there is any kind of persecution, if there's anything that's going to go wrong, they're going to be the first one to bolt out of there. They're going to flee and just let the flock be devoured. Look at John chapter 5. Go back a few chapters. I'll read for you. It says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 6, Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Mark chapter 8, verse 15. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and of the leaven of Herod. Luke chapter 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So when Jesus Christ, he saw a great deal of people coming unto him, it says the first thing he said. What was the first thing that Jesus Christ wants to get across to the multitudes? Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He's warning against all the false teachers and the false prophets. We see Paul in the book of Acts. He's saying that he did not cease warning night and day of all the false teachers and the false prophets. We see him through his epistles, constantly naming false teachers by name. Alexander and Hymenaeus and Philetus and Hermogenes. He's naming all these different false teachers. And I think it's just important that we always are reminded of that. So then if someone actually does preach against a false teacher, we never have the wrong attitude. We have a mind of Christ. We understand, hey, what was the first thing Christ preached to the multitudes? Hey, beware of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You say, well, we don't have those today. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, we have Pharisees today. Look at John chapter 5, verse 46. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. He made it clear that the Pharisees did not believe the Bible. They did not believe Moses' laws. They did not trust in Moses' laws. What are the false teachers and false prophets like? They don't trust the Bible. They don't trust God's Word. They don't believe the Bible. They're not saved. The Bible says in 1 John 4, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are God in the world. The laborers are few, but the false prophets are many. Think about that. The laborers are few today, but the false prophets are many. We need to pray for more laborers. We need it more than ever in this country. People are constantly getting more hardened. They don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want to live godly. They're, they're constantly influenced by the devil's agenda. We see we need more laborers more than ever. And the Bible says for us to pray for them. But I'm going to call out a Pharisee tonight. I'm going to call out one of these people so we make sure we understand, you know, that the, the big name preachers today, the big name people, they are Pharisees. There's no doubt. I'm going to call out Mark Driscoll. You say, why Mark Driscoll? Well, he started a church in Scottsdale, Arizona in 2015. He's not even but 20 minutes away from here, just spreading all of his lies and his false doctrine and his wickedness, and he's a Pharisee today. Mark Driscoll's a complete Pharisee. He's a liar. He's unsaved. He's a devil. He preaches lies. He doesn't preach the gospel. He preaches countless all kinds of false doctrine. And we're going to look at seven reasons, seven descriptions of a Pharisee, and we're going to see how Mark Driscoll follows them all. He just, you think, of what is a Pharisee like in the Bible? He just fits it to a T. And the, mid -name, the big name preachers today, they're like Pharisees. They're like the Sadducees. They, they're not getting people saved. They're not profiting people anything. And we need to realize that when people go to their churches, they're not going to get saved. It's up to you to go out and preach the gospel, to go out soul winning, to get them saved. Them going to these other churches is only damning their soul to hell. So when you think about a Pharisee, I have two points to start off with. What were the Pharisees like? Well, they believed that you could divorce for every cause. And not only that, they were teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, Mark Driscoll, he has an online YouTube ministry where he posts all kinds of videos about different questions that people may have. So he had a question about divorce and marriage. It was a, a short video that he put out. 
And I took a direct statement from his video. He says, Jesus says in the Old Covenant and in the New Covenant, it is permissible to get a divorce in the case of adultery. So he just starts out just like the beginning of the video saying, well, the Old Testament and the New Testament say that it's okay to get a divorce for adultery, specifically. Go to uh, Matthew chapter 5, if you would. Matthew chapter 5. But the thing is, that doesn't make any sense. And it actually destroys what the Bible teaches. Because if you think about the Old Testament, what was the punishment for adultery in the Old Testament? Is being killed, right? So why in the world would God give a provision that if your spouse committed adultery that you could divorce them if they're supposed to be killed? I mean, what does that look like? You say, well, we're going to get a divorce and then I'm going to kill you right away. That doesn't even make any sense. It's a stupid law. Why in the world would you divorce your spouse when you're going to take them out and stone them? It has no effect. It doesn't mean anything. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 32. It says, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now, the, the King James Bible makes this very clear that it's because of fornication that Moses even gave the, the permissible doctrine of being able to put away your wife. Saving what? If a man and a woman were to be married, and they both claim to be virgins, and then on the wedding night the man discovers that she's not a maid, that she's not a virgin, she's committed fornication in her past. Why? Because the tokens of her virginity are not present on the night that they consummate the marriage. Then, he's, then he realizes, hey, this person's not a maid. He was granted that he could put her away at that point. Because of the hardness of his heart. And you know, honestly, that would be a hard thing. It would be a hard thing to think that you're going to be with your, your wife, who was a virgin, you find out she had lied to you, and that she really wasn't a maid. That she had been with some other man, or been with maybe even multiple people. I'm not saying that uh, that wouldn't be a hard thing, but Jesus is even saying that you shouldn't even, you shouldn't even divorce for that reason. Moses, for the hardness of your heart, gave you that as a permissible law, but he's like, you know, what God has put together, let not men put asunder. We shouldn't get divorced for any cause. Obviously, it was, it was according to the law that you could, but saying that adultery is the reason why just destroys that. It doesn't even make any sense. You're saying, think about it, okay? The person that committed adultery, the, let's say your spouse committed adultery, okay? And then it's saying, if you divorce them, now you're causing them to commit adultery. That, that, that's stupid. They already committed adultery. Why would I even care if I divorce them that it causes them to commit more adultery or whatever, hypothetically? That's just stupid. The, Bi the Bible makes it clear that it's fornication. And if you believe it was adultery, it would render all these verses useless. It makes the Old Testament useless. But then he goes on. He doesn't say just for adultery. He says in Matthew 19, it says the same thing. He says, well, if you go back to the Greek, the word there is moiki or poinonia, which just means all kinds of sexual immorality. So that could include adultery, that could include having an inappropriate online relationship, that could include looking at things that you shouldn't on the internet, that could be just sexually corrupted in some way, or having some kind of pattern of sexual sin, or some kind of abuse. I mean, he basically just opens the door to just say, well, I guess if you just want to look at any of the sins of your spouse, you can just basically divorce them. And you know what, in today's country, in America, I mean, when you talk about men specifically, you, they could probably fall in the category of some type of sexual immorality. Just being honest that most men struggle in some area. And if you just really want to, you could probably chalk it up in some area that one of these pastors say, yep, you have grounds of divorce. You can get divorced. There's some type of sexual immorality there. Did he look upon a woman with lust? Oh, he's committed spiritual adultery. I guess you better go ahead and get a divorce. But we see he's teaching for, for doctrines the commandments of men. Because where does it say that in the Bible? Where does it say, oh, you had an inappropriate relationship, or you looked at something you shouldn't, or you had a pattern of some type of sexual immorality? It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. He's teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He's not preaching the Bible. He's not preaching what Christ said. He's adding to God's Word. Why? So that he'll be more popular. So that people will like him. Because today, most people... Uh, know someone that's divorced, or 50% of people, the marriages end in divorce. So, granted, you're going to have a lot of divorced people probably in the church. You don't want to offend them. You want them to feel good about themselves. Maybe they're struggling and they have an evil eye, so they're looking at someone else. 
think, well, my spouse has you know, committed some kind of abuse or done something wrong. Maybe I should just move on. Now I have a reason because of the Greek. Because of the Greek word. Because of what he taught me. It's wrong. It's false. We see the characteristics of the Pharisees is they were teaching a very extreme version. They were teaching that you could, you could divorce your wife for every cause. Okay, But the Bible does say that the evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now when I think about this, I think sometimes when you look in the Bible, the Pharisees, their doctrine may have seemed really clear cut to us. May have been, their false doctrine may have just been really obvious. But I think what the Bible teaches is that the false teachers, as time is going on, as we get closer to the latter days, are getting worse. Deceiving and being deceived. Their deception is even, is even more subtle. It's even more, it's just creeping in where people can't see the difference. It seems more gray to them. There's, there's, there's a, a more craftiness to their deception, to their lies, to the way that they teach the Bible, so that they can deceive and, and teach people more false doctrine. Go to Ephesians chapter 1 if you would. So my first two reasons why I would say that Mark Driscoll's a Pharisee is because he's like the Pharisees. He's teaching divorce for more reasons than what the Bible says. And he's teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He's saying that a wife can divorce her husband for some level of sexual immorality. Now I'm not trying to uh, say that sexual immorality is acceptable or that it's justified. It's wicked as hell. We should never have anything to do with it. But it's not a reason to get divorced. It's a reason to work on your marriage. It's a reason to come to church. It's a reason to open your Bible. The Bible says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? It's a time to get it right. It's not a time to ruin your marriage and throw everything down the drain. We see with Mark Driscoll's new doctrine, now people are thinking, well, maybe divorce is in the picture. Instead of me working on my marriage, instead of me trying to be faithful to my spouse, instead of me trying to give up my sin, Maybe I should just move on to the next spouse. And guess what? You're going to bring those same problems to the next spouse, and it's just going to be a vicious cycle. But what was really clear about the, the Pharisees is that they didn't believe the gospel. The earmark of a false prophet, if he doesn't believe the gospel, if he's not even saved, how is he going to get anything right? And we, uh, there, it's really hard to find any videos where Mark Dr Driscoll picks the, preaches the gospel, which is already in itself telling. I mean, if you're a preacher and you're, you don't have multiple videos about salvation and how to be saved and the gospel, you're already a false prophet in my mind because we're supposed to be preaching Christ and Him crucified. We're supposed to be preaching the whole counsel of God. And the Bible cover to cover is preaching salvation by faith, salvation by believing on Jesus Christ. In the book of John, he used the word believe 99 times. How do you not have a sermon on how to be saved? Because he believes in Calvinism. Because he believes a false gospel. Here's what he said in his... He had, I've had one video, uh, or one sermon that I looked up that he had some quote. He said, how are you saved, or what are you saved by? He said, well, dead people don't make decisions. Apart from Jesus, you're spiritually dead. But God makes us alive in Christ. God puts life into us. God brings us from separation to reconciliation. That's what God does. And then we respond with faith. But the faith is the evidence of our salvation. It's like once a baby is born, they cry. The crying does not bring them to life. The crying reveals the life that they already enjoy. Those who cry out to God in faith, it's evidence that they have been born again by the Spirit of God. Now what he's saying, he believes in the total depravity of man, which is the first tenet of Calvinism. It's where the whole doctrine of Calvinism lies. It lies on this point. It lies on the point that Man is incapable of doing anything. Basically, it's summed by this. They believe man has no free will. Even to the point that an unsaved person could never believe on Jesus Christ. And what he's trying to say, what they try to argue, is they say, well, you're dead in trespasses and sins, and a dead person can't do anything. So, you couldn't even believe. God has to just reach down with His irresistible grace and just save you, and then after you're saved, now you can have faith in God. What he said in this wicked statement is he said, the crying does not bring them to life. What did he mean in this stupid parable? He's saying the faith does not get people saved. That's what he just clearly taught. He says faith does not save you. It's what Mark Driscoll teaches. He does not teach that faith saves anyone. 
How can you believe Ephesians chapter 2 that says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. They twist it. They flip it on his head. They say, oh, the faith is the gift. He gave you. He, he wanted to let you believe in him after you got you saved. Stupid. False. He's not getting anyone saved. He preaches a false gospel. But I want to destroy this stupid argument. Well, what can a dead man do? Could a dead man believe in Jesus? Yes, he can. And I'm going to prove that from the Bible. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. I think I had you go to 1. Look at chapter 2, verse 1 first. And you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. They just love this verse. They say, well, you're dead. And that's true. We were dead in trespasses and sins. But look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. It says, In whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, undeniably, I, I don't even know if the Calvinists would deny this, but when you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes inside you and you're dwelt by the Holy Ghost. You're sealed with the Holy Ghost. But what did this say? It said in verse 13, it says, After he heard the word of truth, so after they heard someone preach them the gospel, then it says, In whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Saying what? The person believed before they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So what happened? This person was not saved, but then they believed after they heard the word of truth, then they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You know what that proves? The person that was dead in trespasses and sins believed, and then they got saved. A dead man can believe, and then he can be sealed with the Spirit of promise. After what? He hears the word of truth. Not only the dead man believed, he heard the word of truth. Yeah, a dead man can hear the gospel being preached. And a dead man can believe on Jesus Christ, according to this verse. If you're going to talk about the, the spiritual deadness that we have, dead in trespasses and sins, go to John chapter 11, if you would. I'll prove it even more. The Bible makes it clear that, yes, a dead man can believe on Jesus Christ. John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He's saying, look, this guy was dead, but then he believed in me, and then he became alive. Not the other way around, stupid Mark Driscoll, false prophet, false teacher. Go to John chapter 5. Let's prove it again. The Bible's so consistent. They have this clever idea. Well, what can a dead man do? Could a dead man believe in Jesus? Yes, he can. Look at John chapter 5, verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Amen. Another proof. The dead can hear the voice of God. Now before I go, go to Romans chapter 4. It really destroys it there too. But let's make something clear. I'm not saying that once someone dies physically and departs into hell, that now they have a chance to get saved. I'm not saying that once someone's in hell, they can, they can believe and be saved. But we're talking about the spiritual death. That's what Ephesians chapter 2 is saying. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. Obviously, I don't know if a Calvinist is going to argue that we're physically dead right now. Obviously, I'm physically alive. They're saying I'm spiritually dead. But a spiritually dead person can hear the word of God, and they can believe on Jesus Christ, and we're only saved by our faith. Faith is not the evidence of salvation. Faith is what gets you saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and called those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. So the Bible is saying, Abraham got saved by having his faith in the Lord. That's what imputed his righteousness. But I like how verse 19 says this. It says, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. Now Abraham... 
when he was about 100 years old or 9 years old or, or older, he did not believe he could physically have a child. And you could say that he, he maybe couldn't physically. That it was only by a miracle that he could. So in a way, he was physically dead. Okay? But he had the faith while he was physically dead. And then he had, the, he had Isaac, his son, the son of the promise. We see it's a picture of the dead man and his trespasses and sins. He says, neither considered, or he considered not his own body now dead. Meaning what? Hey, I might be dead, but guess what? I'm going to have faith in the Lord, and then I'm gonna come, he's going to come through on his promise. Even though you were dead in your trespasses and sins, even though it's no way physically, you can still have the faith, and then you see God's promise fulfilled. We see the picture of, of uh, Abraham representing physically what happens spiritually. Go, uh, if you would, to Leviticus 19. So we make it clear that this guy does not believe the gospel. He had one other video, he says, does James contradict Paul? In a, in a video called Faith and Works. And he says, well, they don't contradict each other because you have to know who he's talking to. Paul's talking to the Gentiles who don't know anything, and James is talking to the Hebrews. And what he tries to argue is he tries to say, well, the Gentiles, when they heard the gospel... They just wanted to do everything to try and be saved. They wanted, can I do anything else to be saved? Can I get baptized? Can I do all these things? And he's trying to emphasize that it's just by faith that they're saved. But to the Jews, they were just lazy and trusting in their faith to save them. And he said, but it was a dead faith. So they needed to get their works going so they could prove that they were saved. Has nothing to do with what Romans chapter 4 and James chapter 2 are saying. Romans chapter 4 is clear that we're saved by faith alone. It makes the distinction apart from works. James chapter 2 is saying, what is your faith going to profit somebody if you never do anything? If you never go out and preach the gospel? We need to pray for laborers today. What's the profit of you being saved and sitting in this church tonight and never going out and preaching the gospel? Nothing. You're damning the whole world. This whole world's going to Mark Driscoll's church and, and dying and going to hell because he preaches a false gospel. You need to go out and preach the gospel and you also need to pray for more laborers so there won't be people having no shepherd. We see the third, this, the fourth point I have tonight. So we see Mark Driscoll's what? He's teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He's teaching, you know, uh, other ways that you can divorce your spouse than what the Bible teaches. He's teaching not the gospel. He's not saved. He's a false prophet. He's a false teacher. But then what do the Pharisees have? They have false doctrine. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, right? And then he explains to them, beware of the doctrine. He has to make it explicit to the disciples. Leaven meant the doctrine, that they're teaching false things. He had a question, did Jesus go to hell before he rose? I won't belabor the point. He basically says, no, Jesus died and went to the center of the earth called paradise. Abraham's bosom, and he took the captives with him to heaven. He doesn't believe any of the Bible. The guy believes he, he believes all kinds of weird, stupid, false doctrine. He believes that Abraham's bosom, meaning Abraham's chest, and paradise are in the center of the earth, where hell is. Stupid. Says uh, another uh, video that he had was, can a Christian get a tattoo? Now it's interesting when you think about this, the Pharisees, they are admonished that they did not believe Moses. What is that referring to? They didn't believe the laws. If you think about Moses, it's often referring to the covenant that was given to Moses, the laws of God. And we see these false prophets, these false teachers today, they hate Leviticus. They hate Numbers. They hate Deuteronomy. They won't preach it. They don't believe it. They mock it. So does he. It says in this video, can a Christian get a tattoo? Go to Leviticus 19, if you would. Did I have you turn there? Look at verse 26. Ye shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall ye use enchantment, nor observe times. Now, he doesn't even address the tattoo thing. At first, he just mocks the Bible. He just mocks Moses. He just mocks the law. He says, well, if you actually believe what the Bible just says, then you can never go you know, grilling. You can never go barbecuing. You can never eat any meat. What an idiot. What a moron. He really thinks... That because you grill a piece of steak or a chicken on the grill, you're eating blood? It makes it clear even in this verse. You shall not eat anything with the blood. So if it's not with the blood, can you eat it? Yes. But think about this. If you actually believe that was true, if you actually believe that was saying what it was saying, the whole Old Testament would be a fraud. Because they're constantly offering the morning and the evening sacrifice 
The priests are constantly grilling and barbecuing all kinds of meats and eating them by the commandment of God. You really think of that saying you can't eat meat? He's just ignorant of all kinds of science and just logic. The fact that, hey, when you kill the animal, you drain the blood and you wash the meat and then you grill it. There's no blood with the meat while you're cooking it. That's just a stupid, idiotic statement that he made. But somehow he has to mock the Bible. He has to mock Jesus so then he can preach that you can have a tattoo. That's the, that's the way he proves that you can have a tattoo. By mocking the Bible. Way to go. Then we continue in uh, chapter 20. Or sorry. I flipped the wrong place. Look at 27. You shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Now, when you read these, these uh, commands of God, a lot of them are categorized, I would believe. They're, they're similar. But you can't necessarily say that the first statement always goes with the second. But that's what he tries to do. He tries to say, well, what they did in those olden times is that they would you know, worship all these false gods. They were really pagan. They'd make all these cuttings in their flesh. And then they would worship these pagans by printing the marks of their false gods on their forehead. Like having a pentagram on your forehead. And he says that's like the only thing that the Bible's you know, teaching that you shouldn't do. But he goes to Revelation chapter... Uh, go to Deuteronomy 12 if you would. He goes to Revelation 19 and says, well, it says that Jesus, you know, in the book of Revelation, that he'll have on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Sounds like Jesus is tatted up when he comes back. Those are his exact stupid words. Blasphemous, wicked, saying that Jesus Christ is going to be tatted up when he comes in the, in the clouds with great power and glory. Wicked. I believe that the Bible makes it clear that it's probably just some kind of a sash or written on his vesture. He that have on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's no indication of a tattoo or a print of a mark on his body. It's so blasphemous and wicked to say that he's going to be tatted up. But you know what? Mark Driscoll's life verse should be, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. You know what I say, Mark Driscoll? Go ahead and get Titus printed on your body. Why don't you get that tattooed across your chest? Teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. That's what you're like. That's what you're doing. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 13. Take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest, but in the places the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes. There thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. Notwithstanding, thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. The unclean and the clean may eat thereof, as of the roebuck and as the hart. Only ye shall not eat the blood. Ye shall pour it upon the earth as water. There you go, Mark. Pour out the blood, then do the barbecue. You know what it's saying? It's saying, hey, don't do the, the Lord's sacrifices wherever you want. Those are supposed to be done by the priests in the temple. But when you just want to kill an animal and eat a barbecue, hey, you can do it wherever you want. In any of your gates. And he says the clean and unclean, meaning the clean or unclean person. Because in the Old Testament law, the unclean priest was not to eat of the Lord's sacrifices. But he's saying if you're clean or you're unclean, doesn't matter. Kill the cow. Put him on the barbecue. Let's have some steak. Let's have some burgers. But guess what? Pour out the blood, you idiot. He's not saying when you can't eat blood, that means you could never grill or never barbecue. He's just ignorant of the Bible. Why? Because he doesn't believe Moses. He's just like the Pharisees. You would think, oh, no one would be as stupid as the Pharisees. Oh, yes, they are. Oh, yes, they do. Go to... Uh, 1 Timothy 3. My last two points. So we see, he's just like the Pharisees. What were the last two things I have? Well, the Pharisees were hypocrites. And not only that, they were teaching things for filthy lucre's sake. There's some video that says, should Christian consume alcohol? Well, he doesn't open his Bible and give any verses. But, he starts out by saying, well, John Calvin, who's his, you know, hero of the faith, false teacher, he said, well, John Calvin, part of his salary was 250 gallons of wine every year. And he still thinks this guy's a good teacher. What are you? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. The, priest is, the, the, the bishop is not given to wine. 
No striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. First Timothy 3.11. Well, I'll wait. Then he goes, well, his next hero of the faith, Martin Luther, he says, well, it's really well known that his wife, Catherine, was a great person at brewing. She brewed the best beers, and Martin Luther always bragged about how his wife was this great brewer of beer. What an idiot! And First Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, it says, Even so must their wives be great, not slanders, sober, faithful in all things. It's talking about the deacon, saying his wife is supposed to be sober. Obviously, if it's a, a requirement of the deacon, it's a requirement for the bishop. Right. He says, well, there's three views, prohibitionist, uh, abstentionist, or moderationist. And guess where he is? He's in the moderation. I'm sure he drinks real moderately. Like his buddy Martin Luther, who is a drunk. The Bible says for the bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. Not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine. The only way I could excuse somebody for believing the stupid, you know, you can't grill on the barbecue is because he's drunk. I mean, he must be drunk every time he gets up to preach. He doesn't believe any of the Bible. He's an idiot. And he is dead. And you know what? You know what? He can't believe. Because I, I guarantee he's blinded at this point. I guarantee he's a reprobate. I would have nothing to do with this false teacher. Have nothing to do with Mark Driscoll. A mark and avoid the man. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. He attacks the King James Bible. He doesn't believe that there's a... He doesn't believe there's a corrupt version amongst the English versions. He says only the New World Translation. He says, I think we should stop arguing about all the translations and we should just enjoy them all. Yeah, I'm going to enjoy the New Living. And I'm going to enjoy the, the NIV, which preaches that rape's justified, preaches that Jesus Christ is a liar in John chapter 7, replaces Jesus Christ's title with Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14. The NIV is a book straight out of hell. Amen. I'm not going to believe the NLT, which takes the word sober out of it completely almost. I mean, there's only like one verse that leaves the word sober in the NLT, just completely removes it because it's a book for drunkards. I'm not going to believe that junk. He says, should you force your kids to go to church? Well, in this video, he doesn't even answer it. He just has his wife answer it. He says, well, I'm probably not best suited to answer this question. I'll just let my wife answer it. And guess what her answer was? No. Hey, you should just pray for them and encourage them. They don't even force their kids to go to church. What idiots. I wouldn't go to his church if I was a kid. The Bible says train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Take your kids to church. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but at their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned into fable. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Jesus Christ said, The Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. Jesus Christ said, Peace be unto you as my Father has sent me. Even so, send I you. And in John chapter 17, he says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now it's interesting, in John chapter 7, what does Jesus do? He says, I'm sending out these disciples, but guess what? I'm sending out every person that would ever believe on me to go out and preach the gospel. And you know what he did? He prayed for more laborers. You know what we should do? We need to pray for more laborers. We need more men of God to rise up and say, I'm going to go out and preach the gospel. I'm going to be a soul winner. Not only that, we need more shepherds today. We need more men to say, I could go out and preach the gospel. And not only that, I could teach the Bible. I could be a pastor one day. I could go out and shepherd the flock. I could go out and turn people to righteousness. We need more people to be raised up to go out and preach the gospel. And we need to be praying for those people. We need to be encouraging those people. It's our admonishment to not only go out and preach the gospel, but to pray to, for more laborers. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for your word. Thank you for making it so clear. I thank you for all the labors that we do have in this church. But I pray that you just bring in a harvest of laborers. That we'd have people going out all of this country, all of this city, all of this town, all of these neighborhoods, preaching the gospel. That you'd raise up men that want to go out and be pastors, to be shepherds. But not after for filthy lucre's sake, but after your heart. To preach the truth, to shine the, the glorious light of the gospel. Just pray that you would just 
Uh, bring in a bountiful harvest of these people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.